I am so excited today to have Miss Nell Merlino on our show. And Nell Merlino, if you don't know Mel, Nell, she has probably more to do with advancing women in the workplace and advancing women throughout the world than probably many other women that you may have heard of. And I'm so excited to have her on because we're gonna talk about Nell's experience, what she's been doing, how she's lived her life and some of the epiphanies she's had in the last couple of years. And so Nell, thank you so much for being on the show. And can you tell our listeners about your very storied and lovely past? Because I okay. know it's, okay. it's super it's impactful. It's very nice to be here. Thank you, Betty. Thank you very much. Um, I, 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 what I'm best known for is I created Take Our Daughters to Work Day with the Miss Foundation back in 1993. And that, for those of you, some of you may know it as Take Our Daughters and Sons to Work Day. It started out as Take Our Daughters to Work Day. And it was the Ms. Foundation is an organization that Gloria Steinem founded. Everybody knows the magazine, but she also founded the foundation. And they were concerned about girls dropping self-esteem and reached out to me because I did big public education campaigns and asked me what I would do about that. What I would do about the fact that girls' self-esteem dropped in adolescence. And so I thought it would be really fun to put girls in places where you didn't expect to see them because, you know, it's still true, but girls were sort of associated with fashion and celebrity and makeup and, and not much else. And what we all know is that girls and women like to do, we like to do all that, but we also like to do a lot of other things, you know, like, like, uh, you know, help people and, 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 and make money and build new ideas. So, so I wanted girls first and foremost to appreciate their ambition uh, for all things, not, not just for, for a particular thing, but for all things and for parents and teachers and employers to appreciate what was coming to them in terms of the new workforce. So, so, so I, I created Take Care Daughters to Work Day and it, it certainly changed my life in terms of being uh, recognized as someone who had done had accomplished something that activated like 25 million people. So, so that's always a good thing. It was pre-internet though. So, so it's interesting in that way. But it, uh, it led me into, I think, really understanding an awful lot about the relationship between that women have with money and particularly with business. Because a lot of the girls who participated in Take Our Daughters to Work Day would write me notes that would say, my mommy handles a lot of money. And you couldn't tell from that whether mommy was a cashier at a restaurant or whether mommy was an investment banker. So I started to really look at women's relationship to money and created an organization that was the first online micro lender in the world where we were making money available to women very, very early in the internet. The organization is called Count Me In for Women's Economic Independence. And we started to make anywhere from $1,000 to $5,000 available to women uh, filling out an online application. And it was, it was the kind of thing, you know, for any of you, uh, you know, who are listening, who are thinking up new ideas and people say, oh, you can't do that. Well, plenty of people told us that we couldn't do this because you couldn't lend money to those women without seeing them. And of course, now everything goes, nobody sees anybody, you know, it's all data. It's all, you know, there's no in-person, uh, particularly after the pandemic, no visits, no nothing. But so originally it was very tough to do. We had got great help from American Express and went on to understand that women also, not only did they have trouble accessing some of that initial startup money, they didn't think they could grow very big businesses or they weren't encouraged, I think more than anything. So we started a contest, which I'm sure some of your, your listeners may have heard of called Make Mine a Million Dollar Business, which helped women grow micro businesses to million dollar enterprises. And we did competitions across the country. One of the first ones we did was in Dallas in 2005 and did those until 2016. And um, they're just extraordinary stories of women going from very small businesses to multi-million dollar companies that they've sold for then multi more millions. And we continue to do work together now. I'm the president of the Count Me In Revival, which is a revival of the organization that came up during the pandemic to particularly help women who own businesses get through this. And we gave grants out and we're continuing to do coaching, which is available to everybody now. So um, I'll, I'll say more about that later. But, and, and in between all that, 
so my my focus, my purpose, and and my my great uh, sort of vision for all of us is that women are fully equal players in the economy and in their and in their own lives, putting ourselves first. Which I I I as a sixty eight year old still have trouble saying, but we need to put ourselves first uh, because if we put ourselves first, everybody else does better. Um, and. Uh, yeah, I've traveled all over the world. I used to travel 100,000 miles a year for work doing contests and all those things. I don't do that so much now and none of us were doing it during the pandemic. I've learned a lot about that. So I, I think we'll be talking about that later. I am an artist. Um, I've been an artist most of my life. I only recognized it a couple of years ago where I actually say that and actually, you know, like show people things. Um, but I've been making things for quite a while and uh, and I'm, I, I've written one book and I'm, a, I'm writing a second one. I am recently divorced and uh, that's me. That's and awesome. I think I said, and I'm 68. Okay. There we go. <laughs> you know, here's the thing, you know, um, I don't, I don't think especially younger generations, you know, and I, you know, sound like we're both, I, I we're just barely in the, the, the middle season of life. Let's just put it that way. But Younger women today have no idea what the world was really like years ago. And it was you know, only up until like World War II where women really entered the, a little bit of the workforce that women were allowed, even allowed to really sort of play a, a role in business. But we were in some ways beholden to our partner and your whole, your whole sustenance and your ability to survive was really dependent on having a partner or your family. Right. And so so just having economic independence is vital. And without your input in the world, we may not be in the same place that we are today as women, which we still have a long way to go. Women did not get the right to business credit in their own name until 1974. So it is not so long ago that women had to go if you wanted to open a business you had to go with your husband or your father or your uncle or your son that that the, the need for male presence male co-signers when i first created Tecker daughters to work day i was doing it in a duplex loft on 26th street in manhattan i lived on one floor and worked on the other floor and needless to say Take Our Girls to Work Day was growing so fast and I needed a heavy duty copier. Cause we've been running the Kinko's, you know, the usual things for the startup. And finally it was just ridiculous. We had to have the thing right there because it was taking too much time. This young man that showed up with the copier told me that I needed, my husband needed to come home to sign for it. Oh no. 1994, 1993, 1993. So, so I say that they are some of the best illustrations of just the restrictions that existed. And even after they gave us the right to credit in our own name, they did it in a way where the banks thought they were doing women and people of color a favor by not publicizing how much money they loan to women or, or, or men in, 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 in the black and, and, and Latin communities. When in fact, what it did was allow them to hide the fact that they weren't giving us very much money. So, and that still is a challenge. It still is a challenge. Um, uh, it's getting better. I, I am a, I'm a real optimist. I've seen things that I, I, certainly we have a woman vice president. I mean, there are all kinds of things that have changed and a woman speaker of the house. But there are, I mean, Nancy Pelosi was first in Congress when the first ticket artist to work day, she had just gotten there. So, so, I mean, there's a real, you know, mother of five. I mean, she, she, it, that just all made so much sense to me, but it is, um, I think we periodically continue to see what has always been going on though in, in workplaces is, is the, um, Oh, some combination of sexual harassment and sort of a toxic environment, you know, in some places, not all places. Uh, and we have more recourse about it, but it's still something that, you know, it would be nice if we could just skip that. Really, let's, okay. let's, 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 just, let's just not do that. But anyway, yeah. but yeah, so I would say lots has changed. We still need to work on quite a bit, but I think more of it 
rest in our own hands now in the sense that we've seen enough women and there've been enough changes where if we, if we stick together and, and, and just say, actually, no, we are gonna put ourselves first and we're gonna do this first and then we're gonna do that as opposed to always running around taking care of everybody else. Lots of things that we can do now that I think help ourselves. Wow, yeah, there's, there's several things I wanna swing back and touch back on that. You know, it's interesting, you and I had this conversation before. Um, I, was, I was a little bit older, obviously, when the take your daughter to work day happened, but I happened to go to my dad's office in the early 80s with him. My dad my my dad was kind of one of my idols, you know. He was smart and he and I like I was a little girl that liked to take things apart. So I would have been considered a tomboy, right? I liked the car. I worked on the car with my dad, which helped me probably get my husband <laughs> way back when. But, you know, I remember going to his office and it was back in the like early early 80s and there was a, you know, a sea of desks, right? In the middle of this sort of bullpen area and then there was offices around those desks that were all, you know, windowed. Every office had a man in it and they were smoking and they were hanging outside the door, you know, talking. And then the sea of desks was filled with women, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of standing there at whatever age I was, probably nine or 10 or 11, something like that. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, dad, why aren't there any women in the offices? And he goes, oh no, this is for management, you know? <laughs> I was, I was such a great image. It is such a perfect image. You know, such and, a I was, perfect image. and I was yeah. standing there and I was, and I was always told I was a little bit bossy, you know, which really meant you were a bitch right? as a kid. And I still probably, you know, am, you know, um, opinionated, but I remember standing there and it was very, very distinct to me. I was like, I do not want to do that. The see nothing against the women, the women were the workhorses of the organization. And there was no credit given there, but I was like, I don't want to be that. I want to be the person in the room with the window. And my dad's like, that's nice. And mom says, learn how to type. So of course I'm not a very good typist because I was like, you know, but, but looking at that and then the, the efforts that you did help pulling us forward is huge. But I think, I think there's still another piece of that. And so when you flash forward and I go into the workforce, I think as women, what I observed and even experienced and did a little bit probably myself is this feeling that we had to sort of claw our way into the room. We had to claw our way through people to try and get an opportunity for promotion. So sometimes there's a perception with women that we're against each other rather than with each other. What do you think about that? I'm sure you observed some of that. Well, it's like this notion that there's only one chance to go steady. There's only one, there's only one, one of those jobs. And I think what we've learned is that there are, the, the, the end of this that I came out on, having had those experiences and knowing like there was no ladies room, you know, in Congress, you know, or there wasn't one on every floor. I mean, all that stuff is that, oh, I just lost my train of thought. Hold on a second. Uh, it is, that we can set our own path, that I followed the women who were starting their own companies because it was too daunting to change some of the rules in some of these places, or it just didn't fit who you were. So I, I, I think we saw millions, as women got the right to business credit in their own name in 1974, millions of women left to start businesses. And while a lot of them, I think I would call the main street businesses, they are not huge companies. They're not the unicorns of, 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 of uh, you know, two years ago, but they're, they are, I would say, extraordinary efforts on the part of women to, to change entire industries by building new small businesses that address certain needs that families and, 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 and in healthcare. I mean, we see it in a lot of places. So I would say that's one of the ways that women sort of just made a just made a left turn and said, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna deal with that thing that you described. I'm not gonna fight my way into the office with the window. I'm gonna get a whole place with and I'm gonna have all the windows or whatever it is. So so I think there are alternatives to that. I think some of the bravest women that I know are the women who have stuck it out in in places like the military and in in, in certain industries where they've never been. 
Um, and I, you know, I, I, I think the, the military, I know women in the mining industry. I mean, what we find out in the mining industry, it's one of my favorite stories. They use very expensive, huge trucks and equipment to move earth. Okay. And right. And historically it's been a job for a young man. And what they finally figured out was it was better to give women those jobs because they treat the equipment with respect. They're not reckless, they're careful. And they have, because it doesn't require strength. It requires, I mean, driving does not require strength. It requires judgment and, and you know, all those things. So, so there are lots of, of examples that I think we have of places that kept women out institutionally uh, that are changing. And the military women that I have met understand things about themselves that are, are, are extraordinary to me in terms of being able to understand who they are in the midst of people questioning their very being because they don't think they should be there. So they have a strength of character that is phenomenal. Yeah, but yeah, so so I think that is continues to be a lot of my work has been to find ways to welcome women and girls. Take a notice to work day was all about girls being welcomed in a place where they not were not necessarily welcomed, like your story, right? You're welcome over here. You're not welcome to everything. You're welcome to the place we've always been. And uh, count me in, certainly. I mean, just the very name is about you being counted in and included and all those things, because I think that is a, a, a huge differentiator in how women enter, whether it's university or, or, or the workforce or their own business, how they, they, they feel going into these things. That they, you know, it's, it's, it's really good if people are actually glad to see you and, and uh, you know, want you to succeed. And I think it's something, that is something we can do for each other is wherever we are to wish each other success because it is absolutely true from my observations and work over 30 years, 40 years, is that it is a multiplier effect in terms of, there's been so much talk about STEM education and why girls aren't doing, you know, and all that stuff that happens in technology companies. And what's very clear now is rather than hiring one at a time in different departments, hire six, hire 12 women at a time in a big company so that they can be together, at least as, a, as an entry group and, and have people to hang with and talk to so they're not isolated in these places where they're the only woman, because that's very difficult. I, I think that's, a, we've, we've read so much about how difficult that is, but yeah. we're learning and seeing companies that understand now that you need to get six at a time or 10 at a time, as opposed to, you know, one every five years. And then you don't understand why she didn't stick. You know, she didn't stick. She had nobody to play with. Um, that's so true. Yeah, yeah, it's too weird. It's just too weird. Too. And, I, and there's, there are women who do well in that environment. A lot of us don't, right. I mean, I don't know, I mean, a lot of people probably don't know this about me, but functional nutrition, functional medicine, owning a clinic, being in healthcare is a second career for me. In the early 90s, I got swept into the technology room because I have, I have a scientific mind. Those things come easy to me and I like problem solving. And so in the early 90s, when computing really, you know, really started getting going, even in the days of dial up for anybody that remembers that, um, I started kind of moving into that arena, went back and got a lot of technical training. And I was hired into a company as the first female reporting to the CTO. And that was a brutal environment. I, I never knew what was going on. It was hard for me to even get, get technical information that I needed for my job because I wasn't one of the boys. And for me, I had to start playing like one of the boys just so I could do my job effectively. And, and it was probably because I had an experience of an older brother and I spent a lot of time with my father that I fared okay in that environment. But I was the first one to hire other females into that department. And it was a fight. It was a fight. And it was always, it was always like, well, isn't there some other candidate? 
And so, you know, <laughs> after 11 years of that, you know, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune condition and a bunch of other things that kind of brought me into this world. I really wonder like the stress of just trying to sort of force my way in and sort of exist in that world, you know, had a lot to do probably with what my health did and the turn it took. But, but I recognize that just from my own minuscule experience in corporate America in a technology arena uh, when women really didn't play in that arena at all. You know, it's extremely stressful to be in a situation where you are made aware that you are undesirable in the in the environment, you know, that it'd be better if you weren't here or why do I have to explain this to you, whatever it is. I worked in a technology company for two years and it was extremely. Um, it was everything I'd read about. I thought because I was who I was, I would somehow, you know, it wouldn't happen to me. You know, that that's the arrogance of I don't know what uh, wouldn't happen to me. And, you know, I think at that time there was a lot of talk about Uber. So there was either that they harassed you or ignored you. And I was in the age group that they just ignored, you know. So so it's 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 a. I I. I Again, I admire the women I know in, in major churches who are fighting their way through, to talk about a patriarchal hierarchy, there, there aren't any stronger ones than the church or, or in a lot of churches. And again, I admire them. I, I couldn't do it. I, I, I couldn't do that because I, I, I just, I, it's hard. It's hard. And um, I like doing other hard things. But um, so I, I would say, I think one of the important things is to pick your battles, you know, I mean, you clearly resolved yours by doing something brand new, you know, where you're in charge. I mean, see that, that that's yeah. also the thing that I think, I, I, I think is, is, is my years of doing this when you can be in charge of your life, if you run a business and you run it for the benefit of you and your customers and your employees and all that stuff, you should be able to schedule your stuff in a way that works for you, all those things. So I would say what I learned more than anything was to be in charge of your money and your time. Yeah. And, and then it's harder for people to knock you off your game. Harder, they'll still try, but it's harder, it's harder. Definitely, definitely. So, so I know over the last several years, um, you know, you went from basically, you know, stepping into the boardroom and helping women do that. And then you had a major epiphany, like you, you kind of came up against the identity that you thought you had, and you've had some things that you've uh, shifted and changed in your world. Will you share a little bit of that? Because I think it's a, uh, I think it's an epiphany I would love to see people have much earlier, myself included. Again, it's, it's, it, it, it's some of it comes from what are you spending your time doing, you know, and, and how do you feel? I started to ask myself more questions about how I felt. I had a very bad arthritic hip. I had it replaced. I waited, I waited too long so that I spent a couple of years extremely uncomfortable trying to power through the pain to do the work at the level that I'd been doing it and kept getting on airplanes, which was so uncomfortable. Just to sit was uncomfortable. And I even saying it now, I'm thinking, what were you thinking? And it was that, you know, you're, you're a leader of this organization and this movement, you know, about, you know, women's economic independence. You're helping women get to a million dollars. I was traveling all over the world. Some of it was fabulous. I, you know, I, I'm not saying I'm sorry I did it. I'm sorry I did it in the way that I did when I was not feeling well. And so that started me thinking about what I wanted to do next or how I wanted to do things next and but i kept thinking it was the content of what i was working on not the whole thing i kept thinking it was issues and not uh, a way of living and a way of expressing myself that was different and that's when i came to the conclusion that i should get divorced uh and and i'm happy to report that i did and now have a very nice relationship with my ex-husband which i that was not my motivation in the beginning, but I'm very glad that I do. I knew I know him 30 years and 
a lot of it was good. So I don't want to throw that away. So it's so, so, so that's working out. And I, I have come to see that I am more artistic than I'd ever given myself license to, and are doing these extraordinary collages of women in, in, in their peak of power. And um, they're, they surprise me uh, in terms of what comes out of my head and what ends up on the canvas. Um, I've already had a couple of commissions for them, which I'm, I'm very, um, excited by, touched by, I'm, I'm glad other people see, see something in what I'm creating. And, um, I think one of the things that women of my generation gave up is that we decided to present ourselves as like a head in a box that because we were so busy proving that we were as smart as men, that we knew what we were talking about, that we could, you know, we could, we could, we could not try. I mean, all that, all those freaking rules about, and unspoken rules about how to fit in, you know, in, in, in a corporate culture or in any culture. Because most of the cultures of work have been dictated by men. And it's only recently that we have been getting in there and really, putting ourselves and our ethos and our, our divine feminine on, on some of this stuff and to admit and own how important that is in any kind of collaboration or connection or invention. That, that who we are as women um, and are deeply all of us have feminine and masculine inside of us, but I think my generation of women hid their femininity to fit in and be successful. And I say this as someone who was fighting for the rights of women and, 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 uh, and creating opportunities for women and girls to be themselves. I was denying who I was, it is pretty, pretty fascinating. I sometimes call myself a, a traitorous feminist in that I did not listen to myself about myself and, and hence all the stuff that happens with your health where you just think, oh, you know, I, I can take this one last plane trip. I can, you know, it wasn't until my mother died. My mother died in 2013 and I was very busy and it didn't matter. I was at the hospital. I, I just, I, I was not going to, and I had the same experience when my father died many years before. I stopped working for a while. There's just too much going on. And I mean a month, you know, it wasn't like I stopped working, but I, I could not reconcile the pace of what I was doing with the pace of loss and mourning. And when my mother died, I, I really saw it and felt it and gave myself the time to not only appreciate her, but there was something, I felt love in a way that I never have after she died. And I would not have if I had been running around. I was just, I was, I, I lived near Central Park. I was walking in the park. I was just doing things, very reflective things that, you know, we read about in other centuries when people would go into mourning for like three months. There's some cultures still where you mourn for like a year. And, so it was some of that that prompted a lot of this. Uh, my mother was an artist. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really taken me by surprise in, in a lovely way. Uh, I wear, I had this epiphany in 2017. I bought this beautiful raincoat that was covered in flowers and I've worn clothes that are covered in flowers ever since. Uh, I wore an outfit last night. There wasn't an item of clothing that didn't have flowers on it. I, I'm glad it's fashionable now. I don't think that's why I'm doing it. Um, <laughs> but but uh, yeah, so it's it's been interesting. All the clothes I used to wear were black or navy blue. You know, I mean, fairly typical. Covered, covered, you know, just, you know, all you can see is my head and my hands, you know, manicure and, you know, lipstick. And uh, yeah, yeah, no, I've given that up. I've given that up. I've given it up, given it away. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so this whole, I, this whole trip of embracing your femininity. I remember you and I had a conversation, and it, and it, the interesting part of this is, 
you know, you said like we kind of gave up that femininity and put it, sort of put it in the closet because it was like, well, we're pushing our way into the masculine world. But in order to do that, we basically become women in men's costumes, right? But you said something interesting to me, and I want you to expound on that a little bit, is you mentioned one time that you felt bad for men because they've been sold a bill of goods also, right? Because I don't want this to be all, you know, that we're, not, we're, we're kind of acknowledging that this men and women are paying a price for this experience. Tell me a little uh, bit about absolutely. that. Absolutely. I, I think what's so, so tragic, and we've seen it during the pandemic, that as difficult as some of this has been, people loved being home. I think there are a lot of people, men and women, who liked being home. I've talked to people who haven't seen their children this much ever and loved it. And I think that's been the male experience for way too long, that they have missed these beautiful beings that are theirs, who love them, they love each other, all that stuff. And you see them like on the weekend. When, you know, why is anybody working to where their family is second in terms of their schedule? And, and, and I, I think we all have to think, I, I think all the talk about why people aren't racing back to work is because these rules don't fit people who have other responsibilities and other loves. And somehow we have to make it so that all of that can work together. Because I am not saying don't work, don't make money. I'm saying do all of that, but do it in a way where you physically feel good and that you feel good about your family and doing it. And I, I think we've learned a lot about that this year in terms of how much we can get done if we lock ourselves in a room for four hours and then can, you know, make lunch, run around, go out and play, do all that stuff. And then after everybody goes to bed, you do another couple hours and you get all your stuff done. I mean, did, and you didn't have to get dressed. You didn't have to do your hair. You didn't have to get a haircut, whatever the fellas do. You didn't have to get the car wash because you're, you're home. So, so I would say this issue of how do you feel? When I really understood how badly I felt, and that I could do something about it. You know, obviously in cooperation with professionals, you know, and all those things, but it is, it is that. And, and it wasn't medicine. Yeah, I mean, it was surgery at some point, but it was not so much the medicine. It was chilling out and making sure that I felt good before I did anything else. So I, I would say those things, but no, men, men, are not, no, men are not doing well on the how do I feel either. They, they talk about powering through. They've been told their entire lives that that's their responsibility. And it's, it's a killer, literally. Uh, if somehow who you are is not in it and, and is not um, satisfied and, and, and challenged in, in, in whatever endeavors you're involved in. So, so I would say that what I'm saying does just not... It's not just for women, God knows. Definitely not. And I think, you know, coming out of the pandemic and looking kind of forward, I, I think corporate America is now kind of hopefully reviewing how we do business and how, how we can really change and transform. And sometimes, sometimes you need a battering ram in order to see that you've got to transform. And, you know, maybe that's one of the positive things that's come out of this entire pandemic. But I think it's giving a lot of people the opportunity to think through that because I know at least the last stat I saw was that small business startup uh, women are leading that charge, particularly through the last year, um, not only maybe for economic independence or helping their family or just just saying, I'm going to step into this and figure out how to do what I want to do that brings me joy and also adds value. Um, you know, looking forward in the next like 20, 30 years, what do you what would you like to see happen? How would you like to see the world transform? One of the thing that I think we're, I, first of all, women are going to be in charge of many more things that we can just see that that is just, that is just, I think the question for women starting now is we're going to be in charge and what are we going to do differently that enhances the lives of 
whether they are our constituents, our customers, our, our employees, whatever it is, what are we gonna do differently that enhances everyone's life? And I, I think one of the things that I, I think slows us all down is shame. Is we don't say things, we don't speak up, we we let things go because we're ashamed of you know how we look, what we said, whether we finished this amount of school, you know, our teeth, you name it. There's something that makes us reluctant to be ourselves and to put ourselves, you know, right there. And I'd love for us to work on the next 30 years to fade the power of shame, just to 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 really start to. Because we see it now sometimes after something has happened to people on social media and they're sort of forced to admit that something happened to them. And what we realize is that it's happened to so many people that it's not something that, you you know, we don't need to be ashamed of, say, like drug addiction. We need to figure out how we deal with it as opposed to it just being something that's so shameful that you don't tell anybody, which makes it worse. So and there are just many things like that. I, I, I think the. So, so fade shame, fade shame is, is like, like a big thing that I, that I think would help us all speak our truth more. Uh, and if we spoke our truth, then a lot of these things that we put up with, we wouldn't have to, because everybody would say, we don't like this and let's, let's do something about it. As opposed to we've done this for a hundred years, maybe it's not a good thing to do anymore. So, so I would say that and painfully obvious during the pandemic, and I think something that continues, will continue to be a challenge until we deal with it, is coming to terms with, you know, quality and affordable childcare. The loss of that drove 2 million women out of the workforce. And it tells us that we have not resolved this. If you could, with your, with your godmother or your grandmother or your mother or your auntie, and, and the daycare center down the street that's kind of okay, but your kids don't like it. But when all of that goes away, it's you. And, you know, and you had people who were having people work from home who told them they couldn't take care of their kids while they were supposed to be at work. It's like, what, where, where do we leave them? It's still this denial of um, there are most precious, uh, there are most precious, but at some point it's like, ah, tag your it, ladies, you know, you're still, this is still all you. And that, that must change. We have to have a system set up that treats children with the reverence that, that we do and um, will care for them when we are not available. And every other industrialized country in the world does it and people love it, the kids are fine. You know, we, we, we got to get on with it because it, it holds us back. All the things that are being talked about in terms of how far back can we have gone in terms of wages and stuff during, during the pandemic have to do with the undue burden that is placed on women and that we have to give up. We have to give up money. And many women gladly did it gladly, but they're also jeopardizing their children by giving up the money, but they knew that they had to be there to take care of them because nobody else would. And the, and, and, and the loss of schools. And I don't think we're gonna have a situation like that again. I hope not. But it, it told us a lot about what we need to pay attention to um, for anybody that's vulnerable. Children are vulnerable. Old people clearly suffered greatly. Um, and it fell to women, whether you worked in the healthcare system or they were your family members. So I would say, and again, not to say men were not doing their share. I know they did, but it's still 40% of households have single moms. It's a lot of women. Right, exactly. Well, it, 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 the assumption made in all of that is that there's somebody else there that is taking care of the finances. <laughs> how, how is that even possible? And we know what the divorce rates are. And like you said, 40% yeah. of households, it's like, it, to me, it was it boggled the mind that the system was like, let's blast back to 1945 and assume this is what the world is really like, that the expectation is there. And I, I kind of hope that coming out of this, that there's a collective force of, of particularly women going, OK, let's rethink this whole thing. And how can I develop a way to develop economic freedom and independence? Because even if you are partnered, 
right? It's beautiful to be partnered and both of you have the chance for economic freedom, but you should not have to be partnered because that's the only way you can have your livelihood. Yes. Right? Partnering should be a partnering by choice. And so hopefully we'll have a collective opportunity for women and men to sort of figure out what that next generation opportunity is for, you know, for- Yes. So, so, so in the next 30 years, that's my hope that, because I started Count Me In with the exact same vision that men and women or women and women or men and men or whatever, all of us together that we could pair up with people because we're in love with them, we enjoy their company and not because they're gonna pay the bills. It's, it's, it's a nice thing if you know, we help each other pay the bills, but it, it cannot keep falling to one or the other. And I, I think the more economic freedom women have, the stronger families will actually be um, because the economy is very volatile. Sometimes you've got a great job. Sometimes you have a great job. Sometimes you've got gigs, whatever it is, particularly if you're doing gig economy work, you need two people doing that because it's so bumpy, you know, in terms of income. Doable. I mean, I, I'm, I'm all for those kinds of things. You just have to plan it. And it's, uh, it's hard when in, in a whole extra job. Well, I, I think what just killed people was it was one thing to make sure they had food and everything else, but then to also do the school was like, yeah, no, I can't, can't, can't do it. <coughs> and they did it. And they did it. So, yeah, I so think, I think the other thing, the other thing that I think we need to do much more regularly, much more regularly, is to rest. I think women work so hard and we have fought for the right to work this hard but we also have to remember that to keep going we need to rest i i, I think there is i mean i i have had days in my life where i realize i haven't sat down all day there are millions of women who do this every day and uh and i love to keep busy and am busy and all those things but in the same vein of how do we feel. Every 10th time we feel and know that we're tired, we should lie down, lie down for 30 minutes, not all day, just 30 minutes, just lie down. I, that experience is so wonderful. Just, just to get horizontal. Um, so resting, resting would be in there. Loss of shame, more rest, uh, good childcare. Uh, there's so much. I mean, because so many of the other things, I mean, include everyone, certainly all the issues of climate change and all those things. But um, resting, I would, I, I would, I would, I would do a campaign on resting, women resting. People would also, I think, appreciate us more if we rested a little more. Yeah, we wouldn't be there. We wouldn't be there ready to do the next thing. Mm. Right. Or pushing for the next thing. Right. Yeah. I think, we, I think we push through and keep pushing because we don't know what to do if we're in idle, because we might have to take a moment to go inside. <laughs> yes. And that's a messy closet. We've shoved a lot in that closet and we don't really want to open that door. You know, good, bad, or indifferent. I like that, I like that analogy. I got some messy closets. <laughs> I got some messy closets, oh my God. Um, yes, <laughs> that's a very good analogy, yes, yes, yes. True. What's been... so interesting is what I did decide to do during the pandemic was to be more introspective. And I haven't literally done as much work on my real closet, <laughs> which I wish I had. Oh my God. I did open one the other day and stuff just <laughs> fell out. I was like, oh no. <laughs> well, and you live it's in New time. York. It's You've time. got very little storage space, so you have to cram, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Get it in there and shut the door. Shut the door. Somebody's right. coming. Shut the door. Yeah. Right. Yes. No, you don't have, you have no storage space, no garage in New York. No. Right. Right. Well, I live in Texas and we have a lot of storage space. We have a lot of space and we still have a garage full of crap. <laughs> of course. Yes. Well, we just, we just have to sift through ours faster. That's all. That's all. Right. That's right. I want to circle back to one thing about the femininity, because you talked a little bit about this and you talked about, you know, changing into um, wearing flowers and probably a little more a little more flamboyant dress potentially compared to what you did before. 
And you've explored a whole bunch of different sides of your femininity, because I know for me, the last couple of years, I didn't even recognize that I had turned it off. I was like, of course, I'm a girl, I'm a girl, you know, but I wasn't wearing dresses. I was kind of like battle through, push on. And for me, that was affecting my relationship, particularly with my husband. It was, I became very masculine in my actions in the world. And I didn't even realize I'd turned off my femininity, but you've done some really interesting stuff with that. Are you willing to kind of share? Sure, sure. I was thinking about, um, I did, I did four things that I went to two mastery classes with a woman named Mama Gina who runs something called the School of Womenly Arts, which was, and I also went to a sensuality workshop in Los Angeles run by a brilliant woman named Dominique Sire. And in both cases, I'd never been to anything like it. The sensuality workshop in LA was men and women talking about sensuality in the same group. I almost didn't come for that reason because I wasn't ready for that. And like, what you want to do is find another man, but yeah, I actually might need to talk to them about these things. So I, I learned about that. But the School of Womenly Arts was magical in that in all of my work empowering women, I had never thought about our sensuality and sexuality being a key piece of it. I had so much bought the argument that what was important was that we learn their rules, we learn the men's rules, we learn how to either bend the rules, play by the rules, break the rules, whatever the thing was, but we were starting from the premise that it was their world and we were just living in it, as opposed to it being our world and us bringing all of ourselves, which is you know masculine and feminine. And I have just really appreciated how much we need that in the world, let alone in ourselves. And it is a softening, but it's also a, a discernment about what feels right, what, what, what feels right, what tastes right, what, you know, what sounds right, as opposed to just jumping into the next thing. And, and, and so I've spent quite a bit of time. I mean, I went from, you know, sleeping in, you know, old t-shirts. I now have gorgeous lingerie. I, I never had that before, uh, which I totally love. And, you know, so, so, uh, and yeah, I'm much more comfortable. I wear more dresses. I hadn't worn dresses. Last time I had worn a dress when I got married in 1994. Uh, and, and that was a suit. I got married in a suit. Um, so yeah, I've really gone, I had been into hair and makeup because it was on television. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was only to look sort of not crazy. Cause if you don't do your hair on TV, it doesn't look good. I mean, it does. Cool. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, and I wore things that made it you know, so that I looked good, like, 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 like I am now, but nothing else and not, I didn't wear anything else, but, um, and so that whole sense of myself has changed, uh, which I just, it's really cool. If, if you have thought of yourself as, I don't know, because I think there was such an effort to want to prove that we could do what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And in that, we undervalued what else we were bringing. And I, and I think it's in those moments of understanding, uh, you know, the companies that have spent more time figuring out what's happening with the families that have children and how can they help them either. Some, some companies stepped up right away to uh, add sort of auxiliary work to the online education. They did all kinds of things. They had tutors because they knew that the moms were either you are going to do it as a professional teacher or the moms each were going to have to do it because this was not working the way that everybody had hoped. And it's that that I, I, I think comes from an appreciation of the dynamic roles that women play in the lives of every community, every family, every workplace. Uh, and if what we're trying to prove is that we're little men, 
given that they've let the men hang out to dry for centuries in terms of their own desires. You, you were just ingrained that you come here, you do this, this is the most important thing you do or you can't feed your family. Um, as opposed to there may be different ways to feed your family. So, so that, that's where I've been. That's, that's where I've been. I've been exploring my divine feminine and it's, and it's truly divine. It's fun. It's fun. <laughs> well, and you and I talked about that. So I was introduced to, to Mama Jenna back in like 2003, 2004. I had several friends in New York. I was going back and forth from Dallas to New York to a school on the weekends, you know, showing up in my business suit, coming from my business job. And my friends were like, you need to do this. And I looked at it and I was like, I don't need that. You know, I, I don't need that. And, and then, you know, two or three years ago, I'm looking at my life going, and there's this gigantic gap in my life. And I'm not sure why, what it is that I'm going to start sort of reaching into it. And when you talked about that, I was like, oh my gosh, I recognize now that I couldn't, couldn't imagine doing that because it was almost like seeing a mirage. Like I, I wasn't even aware that I turned off my femininity. And now I'm like, oh, you know, I'm, you know, engaged in her work. And I think it's fabulous. And I bought lingerie and I wear lingerie and, and I've really started embracing over the last two years, my femininity, and that's only going to expand, but I, I couldn't even have imagined it that many years ago. Like it was I had someone after I did it literally say to me, I don't need that. I was like, Oh, what planet do you live on that you don't need it? Right. I mean, uh, and, and I've been surprised at the women I know that have gone uh, in a wonderful way. And uh, life-changing, just life-changing to think that how you feel and that you experience pleasure are like probably your top priorities. And pleasure of all kinds, not, not, not just sexual pleasure, but pleasure of all kinds. And, It just sets you up for a different kind of day if that's what you're going for, because we get that from our relationships, from our work. We get those things from everything that we do if we operate from there, as opposed to operating from, I got to hide who I am. I got to hide who I am because they don't approve of me. And I'm also not sure I approve of me or like myself enough or whatever those questions are. And there's a whole lot more room in your whole self when you sort of give up on the, the masquerade of, you know, of thinking that you need to be something you're not to be successful or to be, you know, loved or appreciated or whatever. It's, it's very, it's, 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 it's a lot cleaner that it's just you being you. Um, and Hence, hence the fading the shame, because we all are carrying around way too much of that, way too much. Yeah, I know for me, you know, working day in, day out in my clinic with, with women, you know, a lot of times the women come in and let's say, you know, a lot of times it was around weight and their shame around weight and their weight and how they weren't good enough or, you know, rigid enough or all these other things. And they had all these things they either wanted to do or experience but it was only after they achieved this particular weight. And, you know, I, I look at it and I still look at it. And I was like, we, what helps that come off and what helps your body become balanced and healthy and all these other things. Yes. I work with people nutritionally and all those other things is often we have to do the things over here that we were waiting to do because if you, because that in itself energetically shifts everything, you know, and, and, and it really, it's awkward, but and it's, and I get more pushback on that step than anything else. But when women do step into that and start pulling off those leaves of shame and, and all of that, their lives are completely transformed and therefore their family and the people around them, and they're living in a better joy in a place of joy. It's just, it's amazing, you know? And I think, I think Mama Jenna's work and your work and all those other women out there doing this is helping push that forward. I, I started doing this work when a book called Fat as a Feminist Issue came out, which was in the 1970s. And it was the first book I ever read as an adult where I comfortably ate something while I was reading it because it was the first book I read about weight that wasn't about denying yourself food. 
And I remember I made myself this lovely ham sandwich. I just, and, and read the book, read the book, eating the ham sandwich and really came to understand this notion of experiencing what you want to experience in the world because in some ways we have padded ourselves to protect ourselves. So let's try some of these things. We only think we'll do when we're thinner while we're, there's a little more of us so we can absorb whatever it is. And what we absorb is today, this is really okay. We, I can do this. Um, there's so many things, so many things that, um, that we say that about, that, you know, I'm not gonna do this. I, I used to do a whole funny sketch on, you know, what we what we're gonna do when we lose those 10 pounds. Oh my God. And and then everybody wonders why the 10 pounds never comes off because it's Herculean what we're suggesting that we're gonna do when that happens. So we should try a few before. Try a few before it happens. Um yeah, no, I've 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 lost some weight recently, and that's been that's been very interesting because I feel like I have a sense of it now that it, it is literally weighing me down that I want it gone because I just have stuff I want to do. And it, it, it just takes up too much physical and sort of psychic space. And that's been, I never thought of it like that ever. Yeah. That it was, um, it had gotten so disassociated. I thought, you know, cause I don't have willpower. I just can't, you know, cause, cause God knows, I mean, yeah. But anyway, so so I would say that that's a very good good approach. You got to try this stuff as you think about it. Yeah, you know, it. and as you as you desire it, because if you don't reconnect to our desire, if we don't connect to what we desire and give it credence, how's it gonna how's it gonna arrive? How's it gonna come to you if you don't acknowledge that what you desire is? whether it's a piece of chocolate cake or a new bathing suit or whatever it is, you got to admit that you want it and then try it. It's, it's, it's really cool. It's a cool way to go. Yeah. You know, one of our er energy therapists that has worked with me for years uh, said this one time and his stuck with me and she said, Betty, you know, your energy body. So like an MRI reads your energy body. Right. So it's reading the electronics of your body. And, and uh, for anybody listening and, or, or watching this, you've always you've had the experience where somebody may walk up behind you. They don't touch you, but you feel them. Right. And that's actually their physical energy body sort of colliding. And she said the degree in which you're sending your energy out to everything and everyone else. Right. So the degree in which you are living for other people is the degree in which your body must expand to give you grounding. Wow. Right, which is profound. I look at that and I go, oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that was probably a conversation 15 years ago. And it's still to this day, chills run up my spine when I say it. Because what that means is, particularly this is men and women, but I say women, we, we engender this. And if anything, we, we train it to our daughters is if we're spending all our energy, all our effort, everything on helping and experiencing, helping other people's experience, that our body needs that groundedness and that physicality to take that much weight. But if we start looking inward and turning that sort of focus inward and going, okay, what do I need? And it might be buying lingerie today, or it might be playing with paint for the first time since you were six, or it might be, I'm going to eat without judgment, shame, and anger, or I'm going to, I'm going to explore how I'm in an environment that doesn't feed me, whatever that is. As soon as you start doing that, the body goes, thank you. <laughs> like amazingly profound, amazingly profound. Yes. I came to the conclusion that I, not a conclusion, but I became aware. I, I led a, you know, a national organization and I'm leading a revival of one now, but it's not the same as it was. I had done it enough. It, 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 it was, it's a lot to take on leadership. And I, I say that to any woman that's, that's watching or listening, that it's a great thing to do, but you always have to make sure yourself that you are also your own leader um, in, 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 
giving yourself a time horizon to t play that role. There's a reason why, you know, there are four year terms or two year terms and all that stuff because, and, and that, you know, in some companies, CEOs only go for six years or seven years because it takes a lot to run anything. And so I think that's a, that's a beautiful image of what it takes to sort of physically handle it. Oh, wow. I, I'm stunned by that image. So yes. Okay. I agree. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm busy. I'm busy unloading mine. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I can exactly. barely carry myself around. Right. Yes. Oh, so I, I mean, you and I could probably talk for hours. I, I just yes. love talking to you and and really exploring kind of the feminine world and the feminine energy and where we can go. So one of my questions that I have um, that I ask all my guests. So I, I come from the functional medicine world and there's this perception in, in the public that people who are in the functional medicine world have a perfect diet. We don't, we don't ever breach that. We, we eat clean hundred percent of the time we live perfectly. And the truth is, is we all have our own little dysfunction, right? We have something somewhere that we do that maybe isn't always congruent with how we want to live. So, so I have a question for you. Do you have a little dysfunction or a little vulnerability that you're like, nobody really knows this, but I do it. What would that be? I got a list, um, but <clears throat> see, I occasionally like a lot of things. I occasionally like a really good cold martini with two olives. I don't do that every day. I don't do it every week. But if I, I only do it out, I like, I like doing it, you know, out at a nice place. So, so I like having a good drink. I like having a well-made drink. Um, and I love making and eating cake. Now I have one of those super duper mixers. I don't take it out very often now. Um, but I, I can make, I make an excellent coconut cake, a, oh, a incredible chocolate cake with white frosting. And what I've come to the conclusion as I only can make them now for birthday parties because they, and, and, and since there were no birthday parties, I didn't really make any cakes this year, um, that there are plenty of people to eat it because if it stays in my house, that, that's not so good. I like having a piece. Um, so I like cake and martinis. My, my, I had two, uh, my, my, my mother was uh, Irish and my father Italian and my Irish relatives, my grandmother and my great aunt would bring over cakes every week. And it was a whole cultural thing. I think I learned from them. It was a very sweet, lovely uh, way to sort of connect. And, you know, we had them with tea, we had them for dessert, but it was, it was very important. It was, it was very much a part of their visit was, was the presentation and all that stuff. So I think it comes from there and it has gone on just to have lovely meaning. When my mother died, we served cupcakes after the funeral. So, so cake, I would say cake. So I have cake and martinis and no, that, that, those, those are my two main ones. So I was getting ready to ask you now. So um, I know you're working on your passion project book and that you've got some things that you're working on. Do you uh, want to give your website and ways that people can reach out and find out more about you and know more about? Yes. Yes. Uh, you can reach me through uh, countmeinrevival.org. That's, um, I will have it on, on the pod podcast. Yes. Right. Countmeinrevival.org. And we're making something specially available to, to all of you. And it's focused on uh, what, what I call my favorite B words and they are business bank account and bodies. And it is advice from extraordinary women, both coaches, psychologists, and myself about how to take care of your body so you can take care of your business and put all that money in your bank account so that you can continue to take care of your body. Awesome, awesome. Well, do you have any closing things you wanna to say to our guests at all or? A final yeah. word of wisdom. I, I would say to every woman listening, you need to congratulate yourself. And we all need to acknowledge what we've been through this year. And I think we we have done something extraordinary, keeping our families together, keeping our businesses going, keeping ourselves as healthy as we could. And 
And I just want to congratulate and hope that we all get to celebrate more as we um, sort of come out the other end of this. So Nell, can you tell me um, if our listeners go to countmeandrevival.org, what are they going to find there? They are going to find an opportunity for women who own businesses or are thinking about owning a business, a wonderful collaborative community of women from across the country who we get together every two weeks for two hours and we solve problems. And there are problems you solve right then and there. Because I think one of the biggest challenges when you're a business owner is who do you go to for help? And often it's your peers. And for so long this year, we couldn't see people. And so we set up a way where we can do it on Zoom. We have wonderful coaches available. And it's an opportunity to talk through problems that may be happening in your business, but are also affecting your family. Questions about who to hire. How do you handle a broken supply chain? If that's what you're dealing with in your company or, 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 your, or your business. So we are a group of dedicated women who want to see other women succeed. And we support and help women. And it's really fun. And we also do, we do books. We do all kinds of things. But I would say the problem solving is the biggest thing that we do. And we celebrate and encourage and are a community for women who own businesses, who want to get ahead, and who want to get help. And we set up an environment where you can ask any question and we got answers. That's awesome. Because I know, you know, you say peers, but sometimes our peers and people in high proximity to us may think we're crazy doing what we're doing. So, so sometimes it's better to have an outside, what I call rent a stranger and get some outside influence, particularly from people like yourself who have, you know, decades of experience that you can actually help people see through the holes that they don't see. There are, there's so many things that we're blind to. And sometimes all you need is somebody to say, oh, well, did you think of this? And you're going, no, I didn't. And they go do it. And it changes all the information that we give each other about how to hire people, because that's a big thing. Um, and the more information you can get from how people, different styles of doing it, different questions. So we handle, we handle any problem you can think of, financial issues, we, we know who to send you to, but more importantly, we know what questions to ask you. So you can, you, you'll be able to figure it out. That's the other thing. We sometimes just need some guideposts and, and, and that, is, that is what we do. So I look forward to seeing a lot of listeners from this podcast come over to Count Me In Revival as they build their businesses. Love to see them. You know, as a business owner, I'm going to jump on that opportunity too. I really yeah. wish you would. You would add so much to it. And that's it. That's the thing we discover. People come thinking they need help and they, sorry, and they don't realize that they often can help other people. And nothing makes you feel better than being able to do that. When you go to something and think, oh, they're going to all know more than me. We all are best at things that we can share with others. So that's what happens. So it's really cool. Awesome. So everybody go to countmeinrevival.org and make sure you get connected with this awesome, fabulous community.